Again, everybody, this is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel. This program is working from life. Uh, whatever I paint, I want to be able to see it. And it does not stem from my imagination, my remembrances, or a book, or a photograph, or somebody else's painting. It is from life. And that's what I've been sort of promoting for low these many years. Uh, working on a landscape, uh, we do something innovative here that you all may know about. We go out and we shoot a scene uh, with a camera of crew and me, and find the scene, and then set it up, and then uh, put it on the monitor here in the studio and today the scene is a place that I call Bend in the Creek. It's on the North Shore, it's on the uh, uh, wonderful little body of water that uh, spews into the sound at the Stony Brook Harbor entrance. And um, a picturesque of course is what it is, but it's also extremely familiar to me and familiar to anybody that has been uh, going down uh, Trustees Road in Setauket for a long time. It is a sanctuary it's a wildlife preserve, and here is a piece of it. Um, as usual, I start with a blank canvas and draw. Uh, the idea of not drawing and laying out your subject matter is unthinkable in my book. And so here, with a designated painting area, I'm going to start working on the layout. The layout, of course, is how do you, uh, how do you set up this space? The first thing that you do on this planet, of course, is the horizon line. Sometimes it's the ocean, sometimes it's the mountain. This time, it's a landmass, sort of in the distance between Setauket and Stony Brook, and it is a kind of a curvy, wiggly line showing uh, a wonderful uh, green stuff. And then there is this creek uh, that um, occupies uh, a very small area of the uh, of the. Uh, uh, the landscape here, but it's also extremely vital. It is a it is a place where billions of fiddler crabs uh, live and uh, coexist with Spartina grass and. Uh, birds, uh, a wonderful a variety of birds throughout the year. That's why it's a preserve. It also has, uh, in certain times of the year, mullet that come all the way up from Florida, and it has um, clams of many, many varieties, and also sometimes you'll find blue crabs and starfish and uh, nasty things like toadfish in the bottom of the creek. However, they all have their place. And as I'm talking, I'm uh, trying to describe to you the general uh, green uh, foliage that is found in the uh, in this particular part of Long Island and of course it's all extremely uh, uh, native to the um, to the beach area and to this creek. The creek has been a uh, source of study for a great deal of uh, many years with uh, the Stony Brook University as well as the school system of Setauket. Um, it, is, um, it has a lab. Uh, it now belongs to the Stony Brook Community Fund. I'm not sure how often it's used, but nevertheless, it is a preserved area. Uh, there is also an artesian well that, uh, that uh, finds its uh, exit here at this creek space. And here here, as I'm drawing, are these very um, uh, typical and native cedars, beach cedars, I call them. They probably have a much more scientific and botanical name, but to me they are beach cedars and very, very, um, well, they are the anatomy of the, uh, of the landscape by their presence here, and I've been painting them for a powerfully long time. Here they are in uh, their very best silhouetted form against a cloudless sky, and here are these, uh, in the semi-foreground, are the beach plums. These are a beach plum uh, bush, 
which of course produce exactly what it says, uh, beach plums. At this time of year you might see some of the people who have cottages down here um, with their beach plum jelly. Um, so here is the layout. Not many lines, you know, at the most there may be a dozen lines designating where all of this uh, begins to take place. It is um, essential in my manner of, of uh, demonstration and of teaching what it is that you do in order to begin a painting. Uh, that's the question that comes many, many times from my listeners when I'm live on the last Tuesday of every month. The question is, how do you start? Well, you start by drawing. You also start by observing, not by calling upon your imagination or whatever you think you remember from the past, but you get out there in the field and you work from life. Um, I'm mixing right on the canvas, which is a technique that I have told you about for a long time. It saves not only time, but it also saves the need to carry tremendous amounts of, um, of equipment, pallets, and so on. Uh, if, you, if you work right on the canvas, you'll find that you've uh, not had to uh, drag and pull and push and, and, and carry uh, uh, lots, of, um, lots of extraneous stuff, such as pallets. So I'm, I'm uh, and I also cover a large area very quickly with a pallet knife because that's what you're dealing with. You're needing to work quickly because you're playing and dealing with the change of light. If you can apply a lot of color in a great, uh, in, a, in a short space of time, and I'm not talking about putting a large amount of color in with a four inch wide um, uh, household painting brush. I'm talking about um, uh, doing it with purposeful strokes with this palette knife, which is built for the business of putting on uh, uh, a lot of pigmented paint uh, and I do not believe that you have to reduce your colors to uh, such uh, a thin consistency as some of the uh, wide brush painting suggests. I also don't have anything called magic white or magic blue or magic green. It is all colors which are uh, available in the local and um, uh, art stores, and uh, I do not believe that you uh, try to apply anything with the term magic. That sort of that's, that that really worries me. Some there is no such thing as magic. All there is is uh, observation and uh, technique. So here we have. I'm putting. I picked up a little bit of yellow on my palette, which of course has to be taken off immediately because there is no evidence of yellow at this point in this particular uh, scene. Uh, the uh, the only color that you might find on the horizon would be a slight touch of mauvish pink uh, because yellow comes at a different time of day. But it does blend and it does work its way down towards the horizon in a kind of a, an, a nice smooth blend, which I think I'm going to do with a, uh, with a brush after I've applied the color. You can see that um, uh, putting the sky on requires as much effort and as much concentration as putting the rest of the details. Because if the sky is not correct, then your landscape of the area is going to be uh, questionable. You're going to wonder where this place is. So um, I always think that you must pay as much attention to the blending of the sky, particularly on Long Island. Long Island has a very definite uh, feeling uh, for the atmosphere and that's done by the presence of sky. When you live on an island, which is what this is, and not only do you have water to deal with, but you also have the quality of the sky. And of course, uh, skies over an island are not the same as skies over a mountain. Uh, there is definitely a difference. Um, a lot of people sort of feel that there is only blue skies, uh, as the songs will say, but there is also blue skies with atmosphere. Um, the uh, the need to observe this uh, is evident every time I pick up a brush to do a landscape. So, and I'm showing you with these uh, short and purposeful strokes. Do not be seduced and misled by the business of just putting in a lot of blue paint uh, on a canvas and calling it sky. Uh, it may be some kind of a sky somewhere in another part of the world, but it is not sky here on Long Island. And what I'm interested in, because we're doing local origination and trying to get the population that is interested in painting to get out there and work from life, I'm 
showing you how I do it, whether it's acceptable to you or not. It is a realist's approach to painting landscapes. So I have here a blend. There's still some texture involved. Uh, it's not a smooth blend that has been done with, with any tricky uh, technique. It has been purposeful strokes of the, um, of the blend between the pale blue of a cloudless sky and what happens towards the horizon when the atmosphere takes over. <clears throat> so, going that far, I'm now going to get involved in <clears throat> the distance uh, view of that land mass. Well, I'm going to start off with uh, some sap green. I'm going to touch it with a bit of uh, ultramarine blue. Maybe, uh, and, and I'm mixing it right here on my palette. <clears throat> and the um, the need to maybe reduce some of the intensity of that distance shot with a little bit of some silly color called uh, flesh, which is n nothing to do with flesh, but it does reduce the intensity of green. So I'm putting this on with my brush, and it is um, it has been reduced in in in, in uh, vibrancy by the addition of some white and a touch of that flesh tone. The um, the uh, land mass back there is the hills, uh, or so-called hills, of Stony Brook. Uh, Stony Brook Village, Stony Brook Harbor, and a little bit of the surrounding area of Stony Brook. Uh, we, uh, it is, of course, uh, the North Shore, so there is a certain uh, hilly quality to it. Uh, there is also the need to remember that when you're looking at something from a distance, uh, it will lose some of its detail. And when it's put on in a fairly free manner, interpret um, you try to retain a little bit of the uh, of the details back there, but only in a very uh, in a very interpretive way, because this is merely a background for what takes place in the foreground. Uh, the color selection is important. It is, after all. Um, the, uh, the focus is not just on the details, but it's also on the fact that color from a distance becomes less intense. Uh, and um, if, you, uh, if you apply that information to, um, to when you're doing, then you will find that there is a difference in, uh, tremendous difference in the color uh, as well as in detail. Something that um, I think that uh, has to be borne in mind when you're out there looking at it and you stare at it and you wonder what is that color, uh, you realize that you're staring at something which is possibly extremely per confusing because there's so much of it. Uh, the details can be done with just a slight suggestion of where the light will fall on certain major trees way off there in the distance. And that's done by simply lightening the tone of the green with a touch of white. Um, I believe that. Uh, uh, the, just a suggestion of it, it makes it uh, more, more painterly. It also makes it a little bit um, more uh, mysterious, which is what painting should be. You are trying to reproduce a scene, but you're doing it in, a, uh, in something that does not have much a resemblance to the camera. The camera is a, is a detail uh, finder and recorder, and then, of course, then there's nothing left to the imagination of the viewer. Uh, there's a great deal to go for photography. It is a wonderful instantaneous record of a place that you happen to be, or people, or things, but it does not have the quality of painting which comes when the human hand applies paint by hand with a brush to a, to a surface which has uh, got some texture to begin with, because canvases do have texture. But there you can see with, um, with a little sort of a long distance view of this painting that the light on the trees has been picked up by the introduction of a, of a paler tone on the sunny side of the trees. Uh, towards, the, uh, towards the land there is a certain darkness, of course, because uh, those trees cast shadows. So. <clears throat> Um, a suggestion of darkness down towards that land is probably uh, very much in order. We'll give some more depth to it. With that, I've, d I've taken some of the sap green and I've put in uh, a touch, uh, believe it or not, of vermilion red. Uh, the color wheel tells you that um, the opposite of green is in fact red of any color, of any shade. This is a vermilion toner and darkener of, that, uh, of, that, of this sap green. And it, you can see immediately that it gives you some, uh, some depth uh, with that horizon uh, of that land mass there made considerably darker than the top part. So, we have here the beginnings of a, uh, of a typical Long Island landscape 
with uh, just three colors, really. Uh, you've got the pale blue, which blends down into um, paler yet, and then the landmass in the distance. Coming now is, um, is a break, uh, and then I'll carry on with um, the uh, mysterious business of how do you get all this recorded uh, in the form of a maybe a fine painting. Don't go too far, I'll be right back. back again now I'm going to just for a very a very brief moment I'm going to show you human habitation back here there is the suggestion of a house no details uh, at all are necessary just an indication that back here someplace there is a house it can be done almost uh, almost uh, well, with virtually no genuine details whatsoever. It's just sort of a white thing back there, and, and, and if it doesn't really pull off, then I'll just uh, make something a little bit more comprehensible the next time. But there's so much going on here that you don't really want to inter interrupt it with any details, which are going to be probably uh, more confusing than enlightening. And what we have to try to do is to be enlightening rather than confusing. So here is, um, well, I, just an indication of a dark roof which is hiding behind a whole bunch of trees and uh, whoever owns this house may or may not recognize its placement. That's of no concern. What I'm concerned about is this landscape. Well, we have here the great distance of this. Um, uh, in, in, uh, on the monitor it is less brilliant uh, than uh, it is when you're out there in life, but there is, uh, there is the indication of some wonderful sunstruck brilliant uh, grasses that are way off here in the distance. And they are, they are part of the details uh, in very small areas which make for the, what I call the mystery of this uh, landscape painting. You, you kind of look at it and you realize, well, that's just a pale yellow green line running across there. But then you stand back and it all sort of become, begins to take a little bit more shape than that. Um, that's one of the things that draws people to painting, is the mystery of how do you convey this information uh, effectively but without becoming uh, what you might say uh, banal about it or, or pedestrian about it. Here is the shadow of that, of, of that um, grassy area. It's just some brown, some Van Dyke brown and a touch of the, um, of the uh, sap green and there is the lower part of that marshy place over there uh, on, the, um, on, on the side of the creek, um, which, is, which is the Stony Brook side. Of course, the taxes that uh, the people over there pay to get that particular view are probably staggering. And um, you pay for what you get or vice versa. And um, this is what they get. They get this uh, uh, bird sanctuary, this absolutely remarkably wonderful, calm and, uh, and intriguing place where all of this wildlife goes uh, goes through daily routines and it's when you live there that you're able to observe uh, just just how extensive the wildlife is in a nature preserve thank goodness we have the um, people in higher places that are are, are promoting the business of 
buying and preserving this uh, this land. If, if they didn't do that, uh, for instance, if uh, Mr. Engelbright, who is the environmental legislator in Albany, if he did not have this as one of his primary uh, goals, we, w we might see all this lost to development, a, a, a thought which is somewhat, uh, somewhat terrifying for, a, um, for an environmentalist and painter such as I am, but it also should be as equally frightening for the people who live here and who have chosen to live here for the very reason that there is, in fact, some, uh, still some unspoiled and preserved places. The reason for the Art for Open Lands project is for me to try to promote that idea Idea and to contribute in a small way to the um, raising of funds for the acquisition of places such as this. This is in fact a salt marsh preserve. It is maintained and run by the uh, Stony Brook Community Fund and uh, it's been designated as a, um, as a, uh, as a wildlife preservation, pre preserved area. If you do ever wander down or drive down Trustees Road, go slowly, observe what there is, uh, don't uh, think that you've got to run a race, and then you'll see what it is that's being preserved. Not only do the tides bring in something of great magic, uh, such as uh, new um, new patterns on the sand, new patterns on the on the um, bottom of the creek, but it also brings in new colors as the seasons change. Now the season is still somewhat summery. There is still a, a lot of green out there, but it is going to turn very soon in to what I call delicious ochre colors. Uh, they, that's when all this Spartina grass uh, loses its summer green and turns um, a yellow ochre and sort of, oh, peachy, orange, um, sienna color. Here, right now, we're still enjoying the, um, the uh, greenness of summer. Well, here, uh, as, a, as you may have guessed uh, from having watched this program for a while, that the um, parts one and two are what I do on this program, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in part one, obviously. Um, the uh, the uh, part two uh, is more than likely going to be the foliage details. I'm going to slip in this uh, watery, wonderful, creaky area here, which, uh, as I say, is the um, is the home and breeding place of many many varieties of wildlife. Right here, just a stone's throw from the local supermarket. Uh, but fortunately, it is um, the wind blows out here, the rains fall rather uh, rather uh, violent. The sun shines very hotly, and uh, the wildlife thrives. A lot of it uh, was in danger of disappearing and being, uh, well, uh, I believe that the blue crab seemed to have been in trouble for a long time. We have in the area a man called Erwin Ernst, who is the environmentalist, uh, environmental uh, professor emeritus of the area, who has been, uh, who has made his life's work the preservation of all of this. Uh, of all of this salt marsh down here, as well as uh, preservation of uh, other areas all over the island. He was director of the uh, New York Aquarium for many years, and he is now, um, you can see him down here, uh, often checking out and making sure that uh, things are things are going well. Uh, he he um, acquires uh, fishes for and brings back tropical fish, fish from many different parts of the world. I saw him recently and he had just come back from Oh, I believe that it was uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, bringing back tanks, can you believe it, of um, tropical fish that he personally collected there and bringing them back for uh, the general uh, amazement of the public and the educational system. So we have among our midst um, Dr. Murphy, Robert Cushman Murphy, the great uh, environmentalist, is no longer here on this planet, uh, but Ernie Ernst, very very definitely, certainly is, and he is the one that, um, to whom we have to look for a great deal of encouragement and thank him for his uh, absolutely unswerving dedication to this area. Um, 
as I'm talking to you, I'm blending the, uh, the blues of this creek, which is a vital uh, technique to be used. You can't just throw a lot of pale blue on here and expect it to look like what it is. It is definitely got its patterns of color, and uh, the brushwork is, uh, is, is what does it. I could do it in palette knife, but that's not the technique that I've chosen for this particular piece. So, and I'm going to use a little bit of my archival oil to do some spreading. Uh, as you can see, it, 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 um, it uh, liquefies the pigment of the oils, which are sometimes a little bit resistant because uh, pigment does that, uh, but it is, uh, and it helps to blend uh, rather effectively. But when you observe the, um, the monitor, you'll see that there are dark spots up against the land. Uh, whatever reason it is that that happens, uh, I simply follow the lead and um, and record it just as it is. Sometimes the wind will um, will be up and it will catch a, uh, a darker pattern running across the creek, and it's all it's all part of the um, observation, which I'm after almost on a. Um, well, I'm almost obstinate about it. I insist that people go out and observe this if they want to genuinely paint in a realist manner. Uh, I don't think that's too much to ask because I'm inviting you to go out and have uh, a good time. This uh, going out and, and sitting in this environment is a good time. When we took this shot, it was the most um, spectacular day and the temperature was just right, the wind was right, the birds were just everywhere. Uh, there is a, uh, there is a, um, uh, a flock, a rather goodly sum of snowy egrets uh, that are stopping off in our area here on their way south because um, that strange and amazing instinct has told them that they better head south. And they are here in this, um, in this salt marsh resting and uh, waiting to take off and go to, I believe, uh, they wind up somewhere uh, in South America, the Middle America, maybe the Yucatan Peninsula. The snowy egret and the American egret are here right at this moment. Um, and. Um, they don't pose for you, uh, but they certainly do uh, lift up into the sky uh, when they're on their feeding, little feeding um, forays. But they are not going to be here that long. But there are between, uh, some bird watchers have told me that they are between 18 and 20 snowy and American egrets out there. Uh, amazing. There's also the blue heron is out there. He kind of hangs around until it gets a little bit colder. And then, of course, there is the um, uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, now that's a snowy egret. I believe that you're seeing that on your screen. Um, with a wonderful, with the ones, uh, the, the, the egrets, the snowy egrets are the ones with more white on them and yellow boots on their feet. And uh, the American egret is an absolutely gigantic bird. It's huge. It's as big as a heron. So the, um, the bird population right now is uh, fascinating because it's, uh, it's fleeting. Uh, it's going to be is going to be leaving soon, um, and against uh, against a very nice dark background, I can probably just sort of indicate uh, what one of those things is going to look like uh, when it's in flight. It's got to, it's got a lovely uh, well. It's going to be so small off here in the distance that I'm not going to do more than just sort of indicate that something is flying there, and then pick up a little bit of gray and give you the silhouette of one against the pale sky. Uh, the uh, the um, they have a good long tail and uh, they have a nice uh, shaped neck and so on. So oh, these birds are absolutely uh, fascinating. You don't have to go out and paint. You can even just go out there and stand by the edge of the creek and watch these birds in flight. They are uh, uh, breathtaking. It's actually very exciting to stand there while these birds are um, are doing their thing. So I've got three of them in there. It's not very, um, it's, it's a little bit subtle. But that's the way it is. Uh, birds are subtle. They come and go before you know it, they're gone. Uh, when this shot was being taken, um, they were uh, not as active as we had hoped, but active enough to get that shot that you just saw. Well, it looks like um, coming towards the end of this program uh, means that I have to wind up. Uh, I've gotten the sign that this is it. This is part one of uh, Bend in the Creek, a rather poetic title for a common little picture. Tune in when part two comes on. You can find that out from the 
Um, Channel 14 has a program guide, and if you want to find out when this is on, just tune into 14 for a moment. Thanks for watching. See you again soon. Bye.